Like, I don't read Jesus' words as being, you know, and Peter, on this rock, you know, on that confession or on you as an individual even, you know, yeah. the binding and loosing, and wherever you die, that's who's in charge. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's kind of one of the just yeah, get off the train points for Protestants. Why do you guys think that there is something special about Rome, and, and how special do you think it is? Mm-hmm. Hey, I'm Matt. This is the 10 Minute Bible Hour, and I am a Christian, a Protestant Christian to be specific. That's where I fit in the big, elaborate, very old Christian family tree. I mean, it's a 2,000 year old religion. There are a lot of different versions of the thing that are going to come along. And for some people, uh, including earlier versions of myself, I think that can be a bit of a point of panic. It feels like if there's some other expression of Christianity that people are really into, maybe my expression is wrong or there's something wrong with me. And the result historically has been that it can get kind of combative. I've been a part of that myself. Recently, I've been trying to get outside of that line of thinking a little bit more. And one of the ways I've been doing that is by asking questions of people who think other things to try to learn more about where they're coming from. So the guy I was just talking to is, well, somebody who thinks other things. His name is Dr. Jeremy Holmes. He's super smart, super nice. You know what he's a doctor in? Literally theology. He's a Catholic theologian. So I asked him if we could just go sit down somewhere fun. I went to the restaurant in town that we both like to hang out at and talk theology, like really go right at the stuff that is distinctive between Catholics and Protestants historically and see if we could have some fun with it and enjoy each other's company and learn some things. So I want to go talk with my friend, Dr. Jeremy Holmes, and get an answer to that question that I left hanging there. I'm Matt. This is the 10-Minute Bible Hour. Let's get after it. So you teach at Wyoming Catholic College. Yep. Four-year. What's your title there? I am uh, an associate professor of theology. That sounds fancy. So <laughs> Pretty it, good. Yeah. I don't trot that title out very often because it sounds a little fancier than I feel in the room with a bunch of friends. So you and I have had a couple of conversations just talking shop, comparing notes. It's been really fun. Right, and right. That's why I want to sit down and do this because, I don't know, maybe I'm being narcissistic or overly flattering to the two of us, but I thought it was a really interesting conversation. And you didn't get weird at all when I asked you Protestant questions and was like, sure. oh, well, let me, I no. really want to know this and I really want to talk to somebody who won't be threatened and weird about it, but I'd like to just actually ask the question. And you've been great about that. My earliest memories are in fact Presbyterian. Um, okay. My family went through a number of churches when I was young, was finally settling into the Roman Catholic Church. And so it's not a weird conversation for me at all. I appreciate that. We have a, a hymn in our tradition that says, the church's one foundation is Jesus Christ our Lord. Right, right. How would you answer the question, who is Jesus? And we're going to be at the exact same page here. Um, Jesus Christ is the second person of the Trinity, fully God, fully man, the one who uh, came in, to, you know, thrust himself into this realm of time and space in order to culminate human history and save us all from our sins by his all-sufficient sacrifice. In, in both of our traditions, we'd recite the same creeds. Right. It seems to me like, on the question of Jesus, it just doesn't seem like any of us have any disagreement whatsoever. Right. I mean, mm-hmm. God in the flesh, um, mm-hmm. fully God, fully man, mm-hmm. and Redeemer at the cross and in the resurrection. Well, I guess I'm assuming that. I'm asking you questions. Sure. I, where, where does Jesus fit? Like, how would you explain that to a student? Where does Jesus fit into the equation of, of God redeeming stuff? In this case, I'm pretty confident that we, we are on exactly the same page, right? That um, we have a God who is eternal, entirely immaterial, all wise, all good. Um, Unlimited in every way. Right. Um, infinite in being, goodness. Um, he is truth itself. He is goodness itself. Um, so that when you say that that God is also man, um, it's, that statement has the full shock value. It's a very strange statement that the infinite can inhabit this stupid thing that you and I are. But how would you explain that part to somebody yeah, who's, okay. who's coming into faith? The, the, what does the cross mean? Why did Jesus have to go do that stuff? When God made the world, he made a lot of wonderful, beautiful things we don't see. The whole angelic realm, the immaterial beings. And then he made something that from a certain angle doesn't make a lot of sense. He made a weird hybrid of matter and spirit. That would be us. There's a kind of built-in tension uh, in this thing where on the side of the immaterial, solid 
that he gave us, we are angelic, we are eternal, we are meant to, to last forever. Uh, but on the side of the body, which we sort of have in common with the animals, we're destined to die, uh, we're gonna, we can suffer pain, um, and these things uh, make odd bedfellows in one nature, but it, it works, it's a, it's, it is a nature, it is human nature, that's, that's us. Um, but he didn't just leave us in that situation, he gave us a gift that went beyond the ability of either our soul or our body. And that gift was, he says, you know what, I'm gonna make you be in accord with your soul uh, by keeping you close to me. And so that through our soul being in union with God, the body would remain in union with the soul. And this is what we see depicted in um, the first chapters of Genesis with this friendship with God where, you know, God shows up and walks in the garden in the cool of the evening. Um, mm -hmm. And then um, we blew it. Uh, you know, of course, yeah, the first man and woman blew it on our behalf, but then every generation has sort of voted in favor of what they did. <laughs> we, okay. We've all blown it, okay. <clears throat> sort of echoing what they've done. Um, and um, so blowing it uh, meant above all rupturing our union with God. Then the whole gift he had given us falls apart. Now we're liable to death and suffering and all the things that our nature would normally entail. You know, so God didn't need to make anything. Um, he doesn't need us. He didn't need to make us. Once he made us, he doesn't need us to endure. Um, but he apparently took his making us as a commitment and he stepped in to save what he had made. He decided to reunite mankind to himself by himself becoming a man. Yeah, that is kind of an odd route, isn't it? Yes, God becomes an individual man, but he does that in order to assume the position of the head of the race, which our first father blew. So this, this is the Pauline theology of Romans about yep. centering the world through one guy and it being resolved through one guy. I mean, guys obviously selling a little bit short when you're talking about Jesus. But. Sure. Yep. Well, and I, I guess what I'm trying to draw out is uh, to use Paul's language is the idea of the church as the body of Christ. That, that whole idea he's drawing out is the intention behind the incarnation, right? That, that um, Christ wasn't going to become incarnate as one man over to the side, do his thing, blast off the planet, and we're all over here, um, maybe sort of benefiting in some indirect way from his activities. No, that his, he, he became a man in order to unite that man, who is God, to mankind and sort of reconstitute the race. The step to make that work, to make that go, um, was, of course, the, the passion, right? That, that he was going to make up for, to atone for, to bring, uh, to bring the race back into union with God uh, after all the, the things we had done by actually suffering the penalty in his own person um, in a way that would be sufficient for everybody for all time. So that when you or I become a member of the body of Christ, then the, in, the, the, in the body that he wants to assemble, the, the Holy Spirit is like the soul that inhabits all the members and unites it into one body of Christ. Um, and the, the, the key step for us then is to receive that Holy Spirit. The, the whole victory, that is the, the immortality and the glory that, that Christ wants to give us is already present in him. It's just a matter of extending it down uh, to, to the rest of his body. That's, that's in, okay. in short, kind of how I would say, this is where Jesus fits into the whole scheme of salvation. Okay, so the first thing that strikes me about what you just said is that that does not sound that different from how right. somebody in my tradition would say that. Yep. It's really fun to hear that from kind of a different angle because you use some language that I've never heard anybody use, but I'm sitting here running that through my filter. I'm like, that, yeah, that sounds, like, sounds like what we all think about Jesus. It sounds like what we all think about what went wrong with the human problem, sin, the fall, whatever you want to call it. Yep. That sounds like what we think about. I mean, I, do you guys use the phrase substitutionary atonement when you talk about your your theory of the atonement at that the cross? That doesn't tend to be a Catholic phrase, but 
No, I think, I think Christians of various denominations have been reading some of the same very early classics like Athanasius on the Incarnation, mm -hmm. which is you know, you know, where I'm drawing a lot of the way I'm thinking about this. Um, so yeah, there's a, there's a, there's, we actually have, most of us, more in common than just scripture. We, we have some of the very early patristic period in common as well. Um, even yeah. though we might weight it differently in our thought, uh, people of all different denominations have been reading this stuff and thinking about it. Um, so connecting dots the way Athanasius did, is not, I don't think it's a specifically Catholic thing. Uh, I, I don't think so either. And, and I know one of the things that I hear a lot is careful studying that church history because you're about to become a Catholic. Mm -hmm. Like, well, I've respected Catholicism before. I respect it still, but I've been reading church history for a long time. And yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm still not a Catholic. But, but I guess part of the reason that I'm not a Catholic is I, I don't feel like I have to be. Okay. I, I, don't, I don't, even looking at Catholic theology from the outside or reading the Bible myself, it doesn't give me the impression that, that there is some kind of efficacious necessity for me to sign up for the team. I mean, it, I mean, it feels like I'm a Christian. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I know that the question of the sacraments is a really big one for determining well, whether or not I am. And so you talk about, uh, when you're talking about the, the whole thing here just a minute ago, you bring up the, um, the idea of receiving the Holy Spirit and entering into this, this redemptive story, this, yeah. oh, you didn't use this language, the new family of faith, that's the language that I use, that, that okay. Christ is creating, that he's the head of, the, yep. the church body, the body. How do you sign up for that? Mm -hmm. And do you guys think Protestants have signed up? Or do you think that we're in the neighborhood enough, but, uh, but not there? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. In a Catholic view, we're, we're gonna think of the body as, well, bodily, like a, it's a visible thing. Christ established a visible community. Mm -hmm. And if you wanna know where it is, you can like go walk to a place and find it. Yeah. Um, it's, I think we can agree on that. It's possible to think of the body as being um, more invisibly constituted, where, um, the, in other words, it would be possible to think of Christ's intention as being that, well, people will receive the Holy Spirit here and there, and you'll never know in what pockets that has happened. Um, and, you know, looking at someone, you'll never know whether they're in or out of this body that he's established. Um, I, I, you, know, you can think that way, right? That's a, that's a coherent thing to think. Or both and. Um, yeah, that, that is, the, when I say a visible body, I don't mean to exclude the visible element, mm -hmm. right? Um, but that the, the, the original intention would be to have a visible group, a visible uh, congregation, family, uh, inhabited by the Holy Spirit. Uh, now, of course, people mess it up, and they can, they can uh, lose the Holy Spirit through their own fault, or they can, uh, you know, um, they can be in the body sort of visibly, but spiritually they've rejected it. Um, and in a Catholic viewpoint, you would st still say, well, yeah, they're still in it. They're like, um, it's, it'd be as though you, you had a tourniquet put on your foot and your foot's dead now. And so your leg's alive, but the, the circulation ends at the foot. And now right. you have this dead member that's still attached, right? Without the spirit, there's no life, but it's still in the body. Right, um, and so the, you, you, but, but, but that's not the intention. The, the, the intention in a Catholic understanding is to have this visible, you can point to it, you can go find it and grab it, body of Christ uh, inhabited by the spirit that drove his mission um, and have that be his church. Well, if that's the case, um, so if you just sort of take this as a premise to run with it, I'm not, I'm, I, I, I have not argued for that. I'm just saying that that's a way of thinking. Sure, yeah. Uh, if that's the way of thinking, then, um, then signing up would include becoming visibly a part of that group, right? Which is gonna be a concrete thing. It's gonna involve going to a building somewhere, maybe signing a document, maybe you know, having a ceremony, right? There's, there's gonna be things you do so that you are recognizably now and everybody knows because they've seen or heard that you are with this group now. Um, so that, that, for example, would cut out, uh, one of my good friends in graduate school, um, became a Christian in a hotel room, um, when some 
I don't even remember what they were, but some kind of missionaries came by and handed him a Bible and talked to him for a few minutes. Okay. And he started reading his Bible and, and converted. He, he, he came to faith. He took right? and read. Um, he took and read and yeah. believed. Okay. Um, and um, you'd say, on a Catholic view, you would end up having to say, that was really good. But now you need to go down to a building <laughs> and, you know, there may be some paper. So he didn't become a Christian in the hotel room. He becomes a Christian with the paperwork and the baptism. Well, you you guess you would say he's in the opposite scenario of our uh, sinful Christian we talked about a moment ago. The sinful Christian is visibly a member of the church, but dead. Invisibly, he's not. My guy, supposing he has the intention of, like he realizes, I've got to join this group. Um, He is now invisibly a member of the body. He's alive. So he's just like a foot he's running in, around like yeah. ash and the living dead. But he, thing. but he needs to come visibly attached to the group. <laughs> okay. All right. Right. And in fact, if he, if he realizes that this was Christ's intention, if like, if he, if he fall, comes to the conviction that Christ intended to found this visible group mm-hmm. and then says to himself, no, I'm not going to join that. Oh, well now he's not, not in union with Christ. Right. That is, um, it's one thing. My friend, in fact, did not come to that conviction, and we can we can talk about yeah, that, that kind of interesting gray zone, right? But together, yeah. but supposing that my guy in the hotel room, uh, reading his New Testament, decides that Jesus has founded a visible community, then if in fact he has come to faith in Christ, his next question has to be, where is it, and how do I sign up? Right. And I think where we would disagree is on the question of what is the visible community. So I think I think. Yeah, I mean, okay, you've got like your uh, apostle, Kenneth, had a vision, and he founded the, you know, such and such Mm -hmm. community, apostolic Mm -hmm. church of super secret, no organization, we just do things completely on our own. Okay. And maybe some of those churches are very, very nice, but Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm sure you and I would both raise an eyebrow at such a, I mean, that tiptoes right up to the edge of the dictionary definition of cult. Mm -hmm. And I suppose the way we might maybe at the risk of being judgmental, evaluate whether that falls within the boundaries of historical Christianity or outside them would be, is, I mean, can you sign the creeds? Is yep. the Bible work? Who's Jesus to you guys? I mean, the, right. the basic question. So well, setting, well, setting aside that like, bizarro outlier sure. um, that is going to be hit and miss in terms of what you get, I would think most non-Catholic Protestants or, or the, the non-Catholic groups that would call themselves pre-Reformation mm-hmm. non-Catholics um, would agree that there'd be something pretty weird about somebody being like, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm convinced of the whole Jesus thing, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. I believe that I have received the Holy Spirit, and I'm forgiven for my sins, mm-hmm. and I would not want to be in fellowship with any other Christians. That mm-hmm. would be, you know, I wouldn't want to do that. Well, I, I think all of us would agree that yeah. Well, something went wrong there. Mm-hmm. Well, then maybe, maybe you're not responding to the same Jesus that we see in the scriptures sure. and yeah. the same gospel that was handed down to us because yeah. pretty clearly his intent was that mm-hmm. we would participate in this larger body, okay. that we would participate yeah. as agents of the kingdom. Yeah. All of his instructions to his disciples, the second half of what he's teaching, right. his people and the gospels is all... Right on mission, action oriented, you are a part of this part visible, part invisible, Mm -hmm. now and later kingdom, all of this stuff. So this is another one of those places where I think, you know, we high five across the table and like, yeah, we agree. I think where we see it different is the uniqueness of one town and the uniqueness of Rome. As a Protestant, I look at that and I'm like, looks like that's where Peter died. Mm -hmm. Okay, looks like that was, uh, one of the five big urban centers of Christianity in the first few hundred years. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, it looks like some Latin speakers in North Africa mm-hmm. and the Italian peninsula gradually kind of won the argument. Power kind of shifted that way. There was a bit of a wrestling match with the Cappadocian fathers and the, the Eastern Christians. Antioch got on hard times financially. Gradually, we see that city, you know, Antioch and Damascus kind of deteriorate in influence and Oh, okay. Historically, I can see why Rome wound up being really mm-hmm. significant there. But as an outsider, you know, I, I don't look at it and be like, oh, I think God showed up and saved Rome when Attila came. Mm-hmm. And I don't think there's anything necessarily, like I don't read Jesus' words as being, you know, and Peter on this rock 
you know, on that confession or on you as an individual, even you know, yeah. the binding and loosing and wherever you die, that's who's in charge. Mm-hmm. Like, I think that's kind of one of the just yeah, get off the train points for Protestants. Um, why do you guys think that there is something special about Rome and, and how special do you think it is? Mm-hmm. So there's a bunch of stuff that goes into having an actual individual congregation that on a Catholic read, we would say Christ intended to decide some of that because he was in fact founding an individual congregation. Um, so the, the, the idea of the importance of Peter would, be, would sort of fall under the topic of what do we mean when we said that Christ intended to found a visible church? Um, that is, did he, did he intend to fi- found a church that must make itself visible whenever possible? Or did he actually found a, a concrete, tangible, individual community that then moved forward? Because on the latter hypothesis is where we're going to get into. Um, so what did he do in terms of arranging for that community? And Catholic read, of course, is, you know, it would be, well, he set the, the apostles in charge of that and Peter in charge of the apostles. Um, and, you know, there's lots of detail work to do around, is that even a good read or whatever, right? But just yeah, in oh, terms yeah. of and, how the, and how are the be dots totally connecting biased. in the mind, <laughs> um, the, in, 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 in my mind, which I, I think by now is a Catholic mind, I, I hope that's true, um, the question of the importance of Rome actually ties back into the Incarnation. And what is it for? Right. Uh, that is, if, if the incarnation was to be extended in a certain way, um, in the way that we, that as Catholics, we, we think it was in, in, meant to be extended, then that's where you would get an individual guy who died at some individual place having a weird importance in the big scheme of things. Right. Um, that is, if the fellowship is as abstract, um, that's not a good way to put it. What I mean is, if the fellowship is a kind of policy that must be enacted wherever possible, um, then that policy will roll around individuals and idiosyncrasies and individual places and reform somewhere down the, down the line. But if the fellowship is a concrete, tangible thing from day one, and it's this individual, concrete, tangible fellowship that's supposed to move forward, then various individuals in the idiosyncrasies of their lives have a different magnitude of importance for the story. Um, and I think that can be an area where, where Catholics and Protestants can just sort of look and talk past each other um, in terms of, yeah, if you're, it, unless you're thinking that way, who the heck cares where Peter died? Right? Mm-hmm. But if, um, if Peter is already the, the visible leader of a visible group, which is the visible leader of this visible body, and that's a structure that's supposed to somehow endure, um, oh, well, then there's going to be big questions when Peter dies. Like, well, how, how does the structure endure? Um, and um, you say, well, as long as he's running around, we know how the structure's working. <laughs> go, go talk to Peter. But, uh, or, you know, go talk to one of the apostles if they're closer, right? Sure. But, uh, but if Peter dies, what do we do? Um, well, what did he say to do? Um, presumably, he would have taken care of that sometime before he died. Yeah, um, and, and which yet, would make it looks the like, place and time of his death more important for the for, for that structure than a bunch of other places that were big deals in his life earlier. Well, I like the practical rationale. That's interesting. I don't think I've ever heard it put that way. So, as always, I'm learning, and I like learning. The my Protestant brain says, "Well, yeah, but there were all kinds of churches that never interacted with Peter in any way mm-hmm. that were established by." the lesser apostles, churches that spread out from Jerusalem under the leadership of James, who sure looks like he's the guy in charge at the Mm -hmm. Jerusalem Council in Acts 15. And you've got all of these situations where Paul and even second generation leaders coming after Paul, like Timothy, Mm -hmm. they're going around, they're establishing these churches, there are elders there, they're effective. Even the elders who it looks like were probably running things in Rome when Peter got there. Even those guys look like Peter, who, or people who actually Paul raised up in mm-hmm. Ephesus and Corinth. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, on either side of the uh, the Claudian, um, mm-hmm. you know, the tossing out of the the Jews and the Christians alike for whatever that period of time that was. And so, 
I guess I can look at that from the outside and say, well, it looks like everybody answered that question in isolation. Mm -hmm. Not that Rome wielded this tremendous influence at the time of Peter's death, but again, and all of our biases are going to come into play here. Sure. So with my biases, I look at that and it looks like, well, it looks like that was kind of retroactively read into the story. And I think, I mean, you sold me. I mean, absolutely, there's a practical question, but it seems like everybody else answered that practical question absolutely. as well. Absolutely. It seems like it worked pretty well in a yeah. ton of different places. And the other thing that strikes me about this is you know, the more I, I do learn about the classical world and the late mm -hmm. classical world, and the more I learn about what Italian culture was like, and it wasn't obviously Italy, but on the peninsula, yeah. versus Greek culture, or culture in Asia Minor, or North mm -hmm. Africa, or the Levant, it's not the same thing. It's not uniform. Mm -hmm. You'd had the Alexandrian conquest, so you got everything kind of Greekified. Right. You had the Roman conquest, but you sort of had things Latinified, but I don't think, mm -hmm. and maybe you disagree with me on this, but I don't think Latin culture ever washed over the, the mind and the language and the thought process of the, the Mediterranean world the way Greek culture did. No. Like even so, after yeah. the Roman yeah. conquest, you're all still Greeks, mm -hmm. but that Latin legal system kind of sure. fits in. And so the, 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 the liturgical language of the Roman church for the first 200 years was Greek. Yeah. So, well, yeah. the language of everybody was, I mean, Latin mm -hmm. was, uh, it was a, a governmental language, a legal language. Mm -hmm. And that was, mm -hmm. that was about, yeah. I mean, nobody in, uh, Galilee yeah. is going fishing with Peter and learning about Jesus is going to be like, let's do this thing in Latin. Right. But it's also right. understandable how it did catch on. And so again, outside looking in, I look at that and I'm like, that's the incredible adaptivity of the gospel. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. awesome. Yeah. Glad the church had the sense to go Latin when that made sense. Glad mm -hmm. it had the sense to be Greek yeah. where it needed to be Greek. You know, I'm glad there was an Aramaic and a Syriac church and right. a Coptic church. And this right. is incredible. And then... And then it seems like there's this real um, consolidating impulse. I think the, I, I would guess that the Roman Catholic would look at that and say, you know, there's this unifying impulse. Uh, outside looking in, I'd be more like, no, there's a consolidating impulse to be like, this power needs to be centered here. You end up with this bipolar Mediterranean world. Is it Constantinople or is it Rome? Mm -hmm. Politics start to factor in and Rome wins out. And so historically, I've always found myself even before I really cared much one way or the other, I always yeah. found myself, frankly, being more attracted to the Greek claim. Mm -hmm. um, well, I'm most attracted to the Protestant claim, obviously. Sure, I, there you yeah, go. Yeah, <laughs> we wouldn't be doing it this way. But, but you know, of the, of the, the, you know, on either side of the Great Schism, right. I guess I've always felt more like, mm, I agree with the legal sounding language of the Western read on the scriptures. Theologically, I find myself more on the same page with my Roman brothers and sisters, mm -hmm. um, historically, in terms of historical claim, okay. I, I think I'm more compelled by the Greek case, which is a little more decentralized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But come on, at the same time, I'm an American. I'm very libertarian in my sure, mindset. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I'm, I'm from stinking Wyoming. I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, independence, individual. I have to admit that I'm a little bit a product of where I'm from. Sure. Um, what is the internally within Catholicism, what is, what is the narrative as the real uniqueness and exclusivity of the claim throughout the centuries? I mean, if somebody's outside looking in, they're like, should I be Greek Orthodox or should I be Catholic? I mean, yeah. what would be the rationale for why they should fall on your side of that schism? All right, I know that's not an ideal place to hit pause. It feels like a little bit of a dirty cliffhanger trick, but the reality is there's not really anywhere good to hit pause on this conversation because Jeremy's such a great conversationalist and so willing to bounce these ideas back and forth that it just kind of flies along. So I will pick up right there in the next video that unpacks this conversation further. I told you that guy was cool, right? Really knows his stuff. He's a lot of fun to talk with and it even gets more fun as we warm up a little bit more and get more used to how each other do this thing. So there will be more videos like this coming down the pike. In the meantime, of course, I wanna say thank you to Jeremy for being the kind of guy he is and for teaching me things about Catholicism, which in addition to making a friend and getting to know somebody better, this is my chief goal in going and having conversations like this. Hope you gained something from it too. We'll do more of this soon. I'm Matt, this is the 10 Minute Bible Hour. Catch you in a bit.